Good. All right. So everybody have a seat. Get comfortable. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Yushun Chen here to give a, a seminar on his work in China. Yushun is uh, a very accomplished um, aquatic ecologist. He's uh, actually worked in the United States for a number of years, got his PhD, uh, was a professor at Univers University of Arkansas. Um, his research interests are um, fish and aquatic uh, ecosystem health, fish community work, and uh, today he'll be talking about ecological responses to water diversion of, um, from south to north water diversion project in China, a really large scale, um, probably disruptive, but very interesting project. Um, Yushun Chen is also uh, could start another career as a, a tourist guide. When uh, Hong Yan and I went over to China for the second annual Mississippi River, Yangtze River uh, conference, he, ho he organized the conference and hosted us, led us on wonderful tours of the Three Gorges Dam, um, got us on the river, on a riverboat ride, and uh, showed us um, endangered sturgeons and water, uh, I mean, uh, porpoises or dolphins, right? Yeah. Yeah. What was the name of those? Yeah, there's a, the Baij. Okay. Yeah. Well, by, I remember Baijo, but that's the drink, right? Yeah, Baijo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the So he, he's a very ac accomplished scientist and a b warm, gracious host. And I w he was uh, going to organize future uh, compares, comparative conferences between the Mississippi River Basin and the Yangtze River Basin. So I would encourage you to sign up, give a talk, and you'll have a wonderful time. Um, and Yushin will be around here uh, through Thursday, and then uh, we're going to Muskegon on Friday to see that area, and uh, on Sunday he's going to the American Fishery Society where he's giving a conference in Tampa. Well, he gave a paper in a, in a session that Doran and Hong Yen and I have organized. So uh, please welcome Yushun Chen, and uh, feel free to stop by and talk to him anytime this week. Thanks a lot, uh, Aid and the uh, folks in this lab. Um, really glad to be here. And uh, yeah, y y if, if possible, I, can, I want to spend a couple minutes to, to uh, uh, say something. And before I might talk, maybe. <laughs> um, yes, I, um, I did my degree in West Virginia and, uh, a couple years ago and then worked in, actually, I do have, you know, Connection with with Noah, you know, in 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 my postdoc in in Alabama, you know, that project was funded by EPA, but I worked for folks in Dolphin Island Sea Lab in Alabama and uh, uh, Grand Bay National Estuary Research Reserve in uh, Mississippi, and also uh, the Noah Coastal National Coastal da Data Development Center. I think it's in Stanley's space in Mississippi, yeah. So I um, uh, worked on for the, you know, the coast urbanization in northern Gulf of Mexico, primarily in northwest uh, Florida area, uh, and also Alabama and Mississippi. So um, then worked a couple of years in Arkansas and lower Mississippi, and get to know um, more and more friends, you know, and try to build a network and uh, do some more interesting things, you know, larger real business. So since 2013, you know, we started, uh, you know, the first, uh, you know, Mississippi and Yangtze in larger river basins, you know, uh, collaborations on fishes, aquatic resources, and the restoration for the two basins and beyond. Uh, so um, we had a couple of them already, and uh, we had uh, the first uh, 
symposium book uh, published by American Fishery Society, you know, uh, in 2016. So next year, you know, uh, around October, middle, so I'll gonna invite you guys, you know, again to China if you're interested, in, you know, can show you guys uh, lots of interest, interesting things, and uh, also, you know, we do some, you know, develop a potential collaborations, you know, between each other. So um, now I'm gonna start my talk. Um, so this is uh, one of the uh, big project I have been involved in in China. Uh, uh, it's more related to, you know, uh, the water diversion, you know, from the south, uh, south China, from the Yangtze, you know, to north part of China, the dry area for uh, a lot of them for irrigation purpose and also for industry uh, and also drinking water as well. So, uh, so in the coming slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the background. Uh, I'll try to slow down a little bit and so you guys can hear clearly, especially for folks in the remote areas. Let's see. Okay. Um, so this is a map showing the the area I'm gonna uh, pretending. So basically uh, a little bit of background for the south to north water diverging project. So it hides uh, three routes, okay? The eastern part, the central part, and the western part, okay? The western part is still in planning stage, but the eastern part, eastern route and the central route is already in operation for a couple of years now. Yeah. So this is the eastern part, eastern route. So it's basically from, uh, so this is the Yangtze River, you know, uh, the water, you know, it's pumped from the lower Yangtze. So it's pretty close to uh, Shanghai, you know, near the estuary area now. So it's like, um, uh, it's like New Orleans somewhere in the Mississippi, you know, pretty close to the estuary area. So pumping water and the pass through the Huai River, you know, and yellow and high. So basically it pass four major river basins, okay? And uh, five storage lakes. Pretty big, but it's not big. It's great lakes in here. Okay, you will see, you know, the area and the depths in the coming slides. So it passed through Gaoyou Lake, Hongzhe, Luoma, Lansi, and Dongping lakes. Okay, so these lakes, you know, serving as you know storage lakes. So basically, the water is pumping from south to north, store store in these uh, these lakes, then log them. Okay, so the water will not go back. Uh, so the the area includes uh, Jiangsu province, Shandong province, and Tianjin, and the Beijing and Hebei. You know, different. Uh, so basically, like four or four to five uh, provinces is like it's like uh, you know. Uh, States, you know, in US, same thing. So that's the uh, Pacific, you know, oh, you know, the Bohai and the uh, China, uh, China uh, Yellow Sea. You know. Okay. Now, there are more details about the, uh, this route. So, this is the 
Yanzi in the south. Okay, that's the north part. The unique thing of this route is the water need to pass through a couple of stages, about 13 stages, because in the middle part it's higher, you know, elevation is higher than the south part. So basically we need to lift up the water and lock them, then pump them back, you know, pump to the top again, okay. When you get to uh, the central part, so it's basically in here. Uh, I cannot see my mouse again. Okay, here. Okay. I can see in my computer, but it's not showing in, in the on the screen. So basically, in the Dongping area, you know, uh, that's the dividing point, okay? So after the dumping lake, the, the water gonna flow freely, you know, by the gradient to the final, you know, terminal uh, reservoirs. But uh, this route, you know, originally, you know, this lake, most of these lakes are already connected by the uh, Beijing Hangzhou uh, Grand Canal, you know. So after this uh, project, so we build uh, many new artificial canals, make this water connected well. So, and also a lot, lot of pumping stations. So the the project was complete in uh, 2013. So it's not a, too old, you know, it's still new. And uh, during 2015 and 2016, you know, a total of 4.2 4 billion cubic, water, cubic water has been pumped, you know, from the Yangtze to the north. So that's a lot of water. But it's not uh, pumped annually, just a couple of months. You know, from December to January, uh, then during you know, Chinese New Year, usually around the late uh, January to early February, sometime like that, then shut it down, then re repump from March to May. So that's the two periods usually, you know, uh, we uh, operate in the pumps and get the water flowing. But other times, you know, it's relatively a uh, wet season in the north, so they get uh, you know, enough water. So only this couple of months. But in the future, it it's planned to extend the pumping period to more months because in the north part of the agriculture and also urban development, and also uh, one thing is. You, uh, there is a new, you know, uh, administration uh, area. It's called Xiong'an, new area. It's, you know, it's like a sub um, unit of a Beijing area. So uh, that's basically a new area developed in south of the Tianjin and the Beijing area. So that's going to be need a lot of more water, you know, even though the the cost of this water pumped from the eastern route is still very expensive, yeah, you know, because it needs pumped by stages and stages, yeah. And also the water quality, you know, it's it's relatively not good as the central route. Yeah. We will share some slides of the water quality condition because the Jiangsu and the Shanghai areas are the highly urbanized and a lot of industry, so the chemicals are being in the water a lot. Okay. Okay. So here are some of the photos you show in the, you know, how it looks like. Okay. So on the, yeah, I still cannot see uh, this one in, in oh, okay, it's coming out. 
All right, that's the Grand Canal uh, historically exist in there. And we also, we just had some new canals, you know, here to, you know, get all these lakes, canals connected. You know, so the water can pass through easily. And there are the, some of the storage lakes, you know, uh, five of them. And the couple of pumping stages, stations you will see, you know, in there. And the locks. So after the water get into the last storage lake, dumping lake, the water will be released by the new canals to the final receiving terminal reservoirs. Okay. So the water can be stored then and released and then transferred to you know the water facilities in different you know cities and some other you know areas. Okay, this slide is showing a framework, you know, of potential effects of water diverging, you know, on the aquatic ecosystems. So it includes the, you know, because we build all these new canals and uh, also use the existing ones, remove the physical barrier, barriers for different, you know, ecosystems. For example, the lakes, you know, so all these lakes can be connected effic efficiently, you know, the water can pass through easily. And also change the hydrological regimes, you know, uh, because, you know, naturally, some of the water is from, its flow from the north to the south, okay? Because of the gradient, right? Yeah. But uh, now we are changing it, okay? Uh, changes the direction, the flow direction, okay? Another one is, you know, the flow has a seasonal natural pattern, but uh, now we are pumping them in a couple months, okay? Now that's gonna be an artificial uh, uh, interruption on the flow regime. And also some of the change of the water quality and eventually will affect the aquatic ecosystem health and also the receiving, you know, water quality and security. All right, potential ecological, you know, problems. Um, some of them uh, I will mention in the in the, in the coming slides, and uh, um, uh, some of them uh, they they are existing uh, issues. It's, it happens you now before this diverging, uh, the, the aquatic vegetation, the weeds problem, and some of the um, invasive uh, fishes, yeah, some of them from the estuary, you know, and pumped through the canals to the upper lakes. And some of the uh, fish diversity problems and also uh, communities and some potential eutrophication issues. Okay, the good thing is we had a couple of field stations you know, along the uh, lakes, you know. So right now we got um, three, you know, field stations from in Gaoyo, Lanzi, and Hongzhe lakes. You know. So we have some field crew in there and we can have some, you know, long-term monitoring uh, you know, for and see how the, the water quality, how the ecosystem uh, changes over time, uh, especially during the uh, 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 the pumping stage and lung pumping seasons. So today I'm gonna, um, um, because that it, it is a very large project, I have, we have different groups work, work in, in, in this project, and uh, today I'm gonna pretend, uh, mostly focus on the two uh, lakes, you know, the first one in the south, uh, 
the Gaoyou Lake and the last uh, storage lake, Dongping uh, Lake. So that uh, has some of the uh, information to share with you guys and, uh, you know, may, you know, have more information coming out very soon. Okay. So, these are the two lakes, okay, Gaoyou on the left and Dongping Lake, that's the last storage lake on the right side. Uh, you will see the area, you know, it's not a comparable with, uh, you know, lakes in here, the Great Lakes here, you know. it, but it's, it's still very large, you know, about um, eight, uh, 780 uh, kilometer squares, you know, for Gaoyou and the 628, 27 kilometer squares for the Dongping. And uh, we sampled them, you know, seasonally in 2016, from you know April to January, uh, April 2006 to 2016 to January 2017, for the four seasons. Um, uh, before that, we also did some uh, literature data collection. Um, the thing is, and, and this is the tough thing usually we, we face and when we're doing some research in uh, in China because uh, a lot of uh, water bodies, we don't have too many historic data. Now that's a big challenge, you know. Uh, from what we have, you know, collected uh, all the information for this, these lakes uh, available uh, from the 1980s. So it's pretty old, uh, but it's still uh, useful, you know, for our future long-term monitoring of these lakes and also the comparisons. So we we did do some, you know, preliminary comparisons for different period, time periods and see how it changes um, for the ecological parameters. I'll show you uh, very soon. Okay, so this is what we have been monitored, okay. We monitor the, the regular water quality uh, parameters and also include the heavy metals, okay? Okay. heavy metals in water and sediments as well. Uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton okay. and aquatic plants. Okay. Aquatic plants, uh, we only started in 2017 actually. Yeah, last year, there is another group had been mapping them, but uh, it's um, not an uh, intensive one. But this year, you know, we have been uh, collecting them and spend a lot of time in there. And microinvertebrates, you know, uh, it's another interesting component as well. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you some of the uh, uh, information, fishes. These are the um, photos from the field investigations. Okay, let's see some of the results. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, some of them, uh, the, the data we have not uh, completely uh, analyzed uh, and some of them are still in processing, you know, especially for some um, biological uh, data. So today, just some of the, you know, uh, preliminary results. So um, in the future, we're gonna, you know, uh, right now I've got uh, uh, two PhD students and one master's uh, student is work, are working on this project. So hopefully after two or three years, you know, we'll get more products out and have a more comprehensive picture on this. Okay, so first of all, uh, we look at the, some of the available data, you know, from the past in the 2016, you know, that's the new one we have. We can put a couple of parameters in, uh, uh, this, so this is uh, just one example uh, for Gaoyo Lake. Yeah, uh, that's the first storage lake. The first on the top is the 
second disc. Okay. We did see some of the increase, you know, of the of the second disc from compared with the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, the se the second one is the water depths. Yeah, the water depths you know increased you know from from the past. Yeah, the water you know diverging could play a role, but it's not maybe not the only you know reason for that. You know, maybe it's not a uh, it's a uh, pattern you know in there. And also some of other uh, parameters, uh, pH, you know, s sort of increased, you know, uh, from the past. Oxygen is pretty, you know, consistent. Even though we, um, for the annual uh, monitor, the results for the oxygen, it's it's pretty high, you know, consistent. That so oxygen is not a, it's not a big issue, you know. For these lakes, and nutrients, total phosphorus and total nitrogen, you know, compared with the past, it's decreased. Um, potentially because maybe because of the larger volume of the water, you know, uh, then the concentration is being dropped down. That's one possible. Uh, uh, reason for that, but uh, we we'll look more um, as we, you know, monitor more uh, seasons uh, in in those lakes. We get a more uh, clear picture. Okay, let's look at the 2016, the four seasons. You know, the couple of uh, parameters. Okay, let's first look at the blue uh, blue bars. That's the Gaoyo Lake, the first storage lake. You will see, you know, um, the water depths changed a little bit, not too much. Um, mostly in the summertime, it's going to be higher, you know, compared with other seasons. Um, and you see the the red bars, you know, that's the... Dongping Lake, that's the last storage lake. So the water stored in that lake eventually released into uh, the different, uh, you know, supply, water supply facility. In, uh, in the uh, fall and winter season, you got a lot of water depth increase, you know, compared with the previous two seasons. So it's like over one meter difference you know, that that's a lot for a you know for a lake lake for, for a lake that that size you know it's gonna be a lot uh, difference now this is the figure for water temperature for these two lakes yeah so these lakes actually you know from this south it's more subtropical yeah to the north, a little bit cold, you know, uh, weather. So they, had, you know, naturally they have the, this kind of water uh, temperature pattern, you know. Now we get all these lakes connected and see the pattern. Uh, they are pretty consistent, you know. The Dongping Lake, okay, the first three seasons, they are very similar, you know, a little bit lower. With the compared with the Gaoyo, but in the winter time, you know, that's still a couple of degrees C difference, you know, for these two lakes. Okay, this is one of the things maybe interesting. Okay, chloride. Okay, for the first storage lake, you know. They are more consistent and no, not a very big difference is except the winter, okay, season got a, a increase compared with previous seasons. Yeah. But for the Dongpin Lake, yeah, the last storage lake in the north, we got a really high, you know, 
concentrations of chloride uh, in the world, uh, especially the two pumping seasons, uh, spring and winter, uh, really high concentrations of chloride. So I, I did look at you know some of the preliminary and then uh, the, the, the data in 2017 still got this pattern you know so that's gonna be very consistent so what the uh, reason for that it potentially you know the water holding in that area, in that lake and also from the south and some of the from the tributaries from the uh, watersheds may contribute to that. But we look at the chloride in the final, you know, receiving reservoirs. The chloride is about um, 60 to 70 milligram per liter. So it's lower than the dump, uh, dumping lake. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, uh, look at this. OK, uh, new chains, you know, and some other parameters are very similar, you know, following the seasonal patterns, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, one general pattern is during the pumping seasons, okay, because of the high volume of the water, the concentrations are relatively lower, you know. But in the long pumping seasons, getting higher. Which is good, yeah, you know, because in during the pump seasons uh, we need the water, yeah, you know, lower concentration that could be better. Yeah, this just shows the water quality patterns for these two lakes um, variations, you know, uh, uh, for the uh, the whole uh, season. Uh, this is just classification for the two lakes based on the water quality for those two lakes uh, for the site, you know, uh, classification and the contribution for the individual water quality parameters and uh, the uh, for the three different clusters. OK, now let's look at the heavy metals. Uh, this is going to be very interesting because that's going to have some potential impacts on the drinking water. Okay. Yeah. If you get a lot of this stuff, that's gonna be an issue. Okay. This table shows um, only two seasons. Uh, uh, right now, uh, the, the the rest of them have not uh, finished yet. So we did we did see some of the. I, I marked them in red. Some of the parameters, you know, in the pumping season, April it's relatively lower than the lump pumping season in July and the dry season, okay? So it's very similar to the nutrients patterns, you know? Um, but the, the, the concentration is really, really high, you know, the very big difference, couple of times, you know, higher uh, for the lump pumping season. So this is uh, just PCA shows the important heavy metals uh, circled, uh, you know, uh, for the uh, for the water column. So this figure shows the two different seasons: the spring, the pumping season, and summer, long pumping season. They have really big, you know, pattern or difference, you know, in the overall. Uh, heavy metals in in the water. Now this is just pattern for the heavy metals uh, for in the water column for the two lakes. Okay, we we did see um, the the size difference, you know, or spatial uh, difference in the 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 uh, Gaoyo Lake, you know have lots of uh, variations. It's not like season difference. In the season pattern is more clear like in the previous uh, uh, for, uh, graph. Now, let's look at the heavy metals in the sediments. So in the sediments, you know, it's relatively 
stable okay compared to the water quality uh, changes you know different seasons are really re relatively you know consistent and similar no not a very big difference uh, so it's more uh, the issue may come more coming from the water column uh, in regard to the heavy metals yeah. so now this is the heavy metals in the sediments you know for different seasons so it's pretty you know consistent you know and between lakes yeah for different sites okay last part is uh, biota uh, so we monitor a lot of things but uh, some of them you know it's not um, uh, completely uh, finished yet so i only uh, represent some of the results in here uh, these slides just show you know the historic data you know in for the uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton in the 1980s from the literature and from the preliminary results from what we analyzed in 2016 we found some of the species in both phytoplankton and zooplankton uh, reduced you know some of the uh, taxon groups were not observed anymore you know in the new monitoring compared with uh, the historic data uh, it's not uh, fully uh, complete yet. Okay, now let's look at the fish and the fisheries. Okay, um, the situation uh, of lakes in China are a little bit different from you know lakes in North America. You know, uh, because most of the lakes in China are being utilized for some commercial fish, fish, fish and fisheries. So that's uh, one of the Big difference. Um, right. Some of the nets you may have seen them before, but some of them may not. <laughs> some may be uh, different. So uh, we, uh, for the last year sampling, we we primarily depend on the commercial fishermen, uh, on you know the the sampling of the fishes but this year we started some of our new uh, uh, our own sampling uh, in addition to the uh, fishman's sample so use the fight nets whereas and trap nets chores as well we use that uh, so this is uh, uh, the place we we, we, we depend on the chores a lot you know uh, because they have the Pretty big facilities in there they can operate well. But in other lakes, we, we, we don't have this you know, uh, facility access. Uh, I'm not sure you have seen these guys before. Uh, it's still operating you know, in, in those lakes. Yeah. Come rent. Like the units that we use a lot as well. Okay. Now, this slide shows. The fishery production and the value in Gaoyou Lake in 2015. The the red one, the boss, is the value, right? 2015 value. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't you know, have the English name for this fish, but uh, there it's um, text in here. So primarily cops. Yeah, cops. Are, a problem for you guys in here, but uh, yeah, not a problem for us in there. <laughs> not the um, you know, economic products in there. So um, then followed by crabs, you know, shrimps and mandarin fish. They are you know high valued products. Yeah. Uh, so the blue line is showing the production of the magical town. Okay. So primarily by the crabs. But they are also by some of the small sized fishes, you know, low economic values. You know, uh, they are still contributing a lot you know, in, in these lakes. Okay. The interesting part um, could be the coming two slides for the fish communities. So we compare the 1980s to the 2016. Uh, for both Gaoyou and Dongping lakes. Um, 
So in Gaoyo Lake, we found, found 55 species, fish species in 80s, you know, 1980s. The, in the new monitor, we only found 51. So basically, we got the four, uh, uh, not you know, listed all, but this is just total number. You know, in, in slides, we are showed you know, what, what are those guys. Um, the similar pattern for the Dumpy Lake, you know, the chem commercials. So the green ones I highlighted in here are those we found in the 1980s, but not uh, uh, collected in the 2016. Yeah. So these guys are gone during our recent monitoring. Yeah. And we have got three more in here on this slide for the green ones. And the, the red ones, the, these two, okay, they are, you know, not observed in 1980s okay, in those lakes, but uh, were found in 2016. Uh, these two guys are the estuary fisheries, fishes, okay. So there is a potential, the water, the, the through the seawater intruding and pass through the lakes, yeah, cannot get into the lakes. Yeah. So, um, just a pre preliminary conclusions for the uh, water depths, water quality changes and heavy metals. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention about the uh, some of the fish. Uh, Resident fishes, you know, some of the you know, crops, uh, the that reduced the while some lake river migration fishes were increased. That's may related to the you know the water pumping, you know, the lakes, I'd say, you know, partially uh, passing through you know the water may change the habitat for the fishes. Yeah. And also the estuary fish, you know, were uh, newly found, you know in these lakes. I think that, and uh, that's it for the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Feel free to have questions. I'm glad to uh, chat with you, anything. Yes. Uh, in 2016, we only got the, the my group only got these two lakes, and uh, I, we do have access to data from uh, other lakes from other groups. Uh, but 2017, since I got more people, you know, two ma two PhDs and one master, so, so I we I got uh, my own data for all these lakes and the canals. I show this slide so people get a more clear idea on this. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the remote folks may not hear you <laughs> if you don't use microscope. Any additional monitoring plan for the Yangtze as well? Yes. Uh, understanding of entrainment, impingement, and stuff associated with the pumping. Uh, can you repeat? Sorry. Yeah, is there monitoring going going on down in the Yangtze as well, and any quantification of entrainment and impingement of fishes as they're pumped through? Yes, yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, we yeah um, beside this project, we had another uh, project in Yangtze and actually started this year. We, you know, I, 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 I did think about, you know, when I started this project, I did think about, you know, look at it, the estuary conditions, you know, because we're pumping water. So the the issue now um, actually in here is the Yangtze in the upstream, we got a lot of dams. So the water is holding in there, you know. So less water coming out to the downstream. And in the downstream, we got the diverging, we pumping water from the Yangtze to the north. So there is a possibility and the potential 
of having more estuary or seawater coming in. Right? And also, you know, biological communities will be changed as well. So we started to monitor in the estuary area you know, this year. We do have some uh, pre pre previous uh, uh, yes monitoring data as well, but it's from other groups. So that's good question. Thank you. Any other yes? Yes. Um, I did not have an exact number. I would say, uh, within 200 meters, yes, from the top to the lower. Yeah. Yes, because they need more water in the north, because especially for the more urban and agriculture development in the north, and also the new uh, Beijing sub-administration unit is being built in there, in the north. So that's kind of a lot of more expansion, you know, I need more water in there. So planned by 2020, and in 2030, there will gonna be uh, multiple times water will be pumped. You know, like, like this, right now it's about 4.2 billion cubic meters, you know, for one year period. But that's gonna be tripled and uh, multiple times higher than this in the future. So that's one of the things we're trying to how the modeling component in there and have some future predictions when we have different scenarios of pumping and how the ecosystem is going to be changed in the future. And another thing interesting in here is it's the potential, you know, climate change and for example, global warming, you know, the will reduce the water temperature difference from south to the north. So more fishes will be transferred you know, by the water, pumped to the north, and they can survive in there. Because currently, some of the some of the aquatic organisms they cannot survive in the Dongping Lake and the north part because of the temperature, you know, especially during the winter time. But that's a potential, you know, you get a higher temperature, and, you know, more global warming, you know. But Trump doesn't like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. So, uh, do you have an idea? Uh, usually, when the intru uh, species intrusions uh, occur, I mean, uh, does it occur during some special events or situations? For example, during upwelling uh, along the uh, coastal area or during the low uh, river discharge. Okay, I think it's more related to the the volume or the discharge of the river. Uh, as mentioned, that because the operations of the QJ dams in the upper reach of the Yangtze, they also store the water, you know, a couple of months, then release. And during the period that we got the nest flow from the upper stream, now the downstream, have less flow. And then during that season, we also pump in the water from the Yangtze to the north. That's the best time the sea intruding and the more estuarine water come in, you know, to the inland. So that's, uh, it depends on the flow hydrology, yes. You mentioned the Grand Canal. Yes. That that's an older canal, right? That's right. That's um, many many yeah years ago. Yeah. Yeah. When when was that built, and then where did it extend to? I think to? if I'm correct, it's about um, like uh, 
1800 years ago, maybe. Not very, you know, I think from which dynasty, dynasty, I forgot. It's been long, but it's just partially, you know, just part of the, uh, I didn't show. Uh, so from Hangzhou, that's the city below the uh, south of the Yangtze, you know, yeah. and passed through uh, to Beijing, but uh, it was disconnected when it passed through the Yellow River, you know. So about the Yellow River, it's not connected at all. So only the south part. But right now, we have lots of new canals, you know, new canals being built to connect mm -hmm. all these. So the Grand Canal is still a main, you know, water pass, you know, uh, uh, facility. And yeah. but we have more canals, new canals, yes. What what was the um, I think you showed it, but yes, before this pumping started, what was the uh, seasonal difference in water depth in a lake? Uh, uh, okay, you're talking about uh, the 1980s, maybe. Yeah. The water depths. I didn't. I didn't. See, uh, Analyze them in in seasonal sag cycle, but uh, it's it's lower. You know, the second one is the water depths uh, for the two periods, uh, because those data it's yeah uh, it's not a continuous monitoring. Just some of the times, and then we compile the data and put them together in one period, 1980s. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. In the in the Great Lakes, um, I think. Our hydrologist Drew has found a, a meter change in the water level from one year to the next. Oh, really? Of, so that's a natural pattern. Uh, <laughs> well, you could you could argue about that, I guess. It's uh, it has to do with evaporation and, and okay. uh, cold winter, a very cold winter. Mm -hmm. um, the water level was low and then came up a meter. Mm -hmm over the course of I think one year right yeah so really dramatic but we I don't think we really know what the biological consequences of that what were okay do you think you know, that the you know for example this the same change of one meter for lakes in there because they're smaller and change of one meter in here are they going to be different? Maybe it's going to be different. The small lakes so you change one meter, so the total volume dropped, uh, you know, relatively. That's a lot compared with because the lakes pretty sh shallow, you know, not you know, mm, about see uh, two meters, uh, not too deep. But in here, I think the lakes really deep, right? So that's. Uh, Maybe change it more, I guess, but I'm not sure. That is a good thought. Yeah. yeah. So yes, we have to find out what's the natural, you know, pattern or impacts. Then we add these, you know, artificial components in, you know, and see how it plays. So, you know, we cannot say, oh, these are all coming from the diverging, you know. Right. So we need to distinguish, you know, other natural or other artificial or anthropogenic effects, you know, how it plays on those. That's very important, I think. Yes.